Howdy, everybody. So yeah, my uh, topic today is um, basically face mask ventilation prior to neuromuscular blockade, as Dr. Freed was just speaking to. And so really the claim, so I kind of came at this from uh, my experience in my anesthesia electives. And basically from what I was called, always instructed by my attendings is that, you know, for anybody undergoing general anesthesia, the ability to ventilate via face mask should always be checked or confirmed before we deliver a paralytic and before we intubate. And so really the objectives for today, um, just kind of identifying the rationale behind why we're needing to verify mask ventilation status. And then really what impact does checking for adequate mask ventilation before giving paralytics have on airway management? And so just for a little bit of context for anybody who it's been some time before your last, uh, your last OR exposure, I have a little clip here. Um, basically a little bit of context. This is from an actual procedure. Um, basically the anesthesiologist is gonna be pre-oxygenating the patient. Um, kind of out of frame, you'll see somebody deliver a medication. They'll drop the syringe on the tray and then the anesthesiologist will reach over to the reservoir bag and give it a couple of um, squeezes just to make sure that we can actually move airflow through the, uh, the face mask. So the patient is uh, in deep sedation. So we have to do a trial uh, ventilation. So and so really that's all it is. It's not anything that's overly exciting. It's just kind of a routine that basically everyone that I encountered um, at the vast majority of my uh, kind of rotations always said this is a step that we do. Um, typically what would follow is after face mask ventilation was deemed to be adequate, there wasn't any you know, overall difficulty, we'd deliver the paralytic and then we'd try and innovate. And just kind of a little bit of backgrounds. Um, I tried to really see where this kind of rationale came from. Um, I has had a little bit of trouble kind of tracking down the exact origin, but uh, just kind of a little bit of context to kind of show that, uh, you know, this is something that's you know, been previously deemed to be necessary in the literature. So the sequence on the left is from a uh, kind of airway management guideline put out by UCSF for kind of advanced healthcare providers. And basically we see a little highlight step there. So we've already administered our sedatives. So basically we've already induced, we're gonna assess for ability to face mask ventilate. And then afterwards we can deliver our paralytic. The text page over from the right is from um, Morgan and Mikhail, which is kind of like one of the big books of anesthesia. Um, and then this is chapter is specifically in regards to kind of um, innovation sequence. So we see the paragraph above pre-oxygenation, then bag and mask ventilation. A little bit more context to just kind of show the overall history of this claim. So the article on the left is from a 1991 um, kind of op-ed published in anesthesia and analgesia. Um, again, dogma administration of muscle blockade uh, should only occur after ability to advance mask ventilate is verified. And on the right, again, similar kind of uh, documentation showing that this is a long-standing uh, practice in the field. And so really the rationale behind this um, is kind of, you know, as we allude to in the Rubicon, you know, the bridge of no return and then the chase of agent or the choice of agent. As far as the bridge of no return, um, you know, the overall thought is that if the airway was unable to be secured or if the mask ventilation was too difficult, essentially after we've induced, the patient could simply just be allowed to awaken and we can use alternate plans either, you know, um, fiber optic intubation, something along those lines in order to secure our airway. Uh, there's also some idea that um, when we're assessing face mask ventilation, kind of the overall quality of it can kind of help guide our choice of neuromuscular blockade agent, whether or not we want to use something that's fast acting, succinylcholine, or something that's going to be a little bit longer acting like um, um, cisatricurium. And then on the right, basically, we just have an overall kind of uh, sequence as far as difficult airway management put out by 
ASA. And I think we're looking somewhere along those lines as far as where this step occurs. So before innovation, somewhere in there, we should be checking face mask ventilation. And so I guess kind of based on all of this, you know, how long does it really take for a patient to desaturate? Um, so in 1984, uh, Drummond published a study in the British Journal of Anesthesiology entitled Arterial Oxygen Saturation Before Innovation of Trachea. Uh, the study was kind of split into two different parts. The first concentrated on arterial oxygenation, a group of 20 patients undergoing general anesthesia. And importantly, they did not receive any pre-oxygenation. This was kind of early, all, early on before really that practice of pre-oxygenating was just kind of established as the, the standard go-to. So in, the, uh, in that group, so the groups were analyzed for their overall smoking habits, um, their weight, height, uh, hemoglobin concentration, FEC and FEV1. The patients were allowed to breathe room air pre-medicated with uh, 10 to 20 milligrams of temazepam one hour prior to induction, and then under, underwent monitoring with both ECG and pulse oximetry, which was analyzed via an ear oximeter. Once the oximetry readings stabilized um, at around an average concentration of around 95.6%, um, they were induced with three to five milligrams per kilogram of thiopentone, and then given 100 milligrams of succinylcholine. The saturation measurements were then um, assessed one minute after apnea was achieved, and the average saturation at that time was 85.5%. Um, again, this was kind of the first aspect of the study. The second part was really looking to see what effect does pre-oxygenation have. So this first aspect, no oxygenation whatsoever. In the next one, we see a little bit more of a detail as far as what uh, pre-oxygenating these patients have. And so the group that we're looking at, or the table rather, that we're looking at here is table three down here. This is the second aspect of the study. So in that portion, uh, 40 participants were split into four groups of 10. Now each group was kind of underwent identical premedication and induction regimens and were given, given additional boluses of thiopentone and succinylcholine to make sure that apnea was maintained throughout. Uh, the saturary, uh, oxygen saturation was then measured at one and three minute increments after induction and apnea and was, um, and apnea was kind of, um, sorry, one and three minutes post-induction, and then oxygenation was uh, kind of given in different ways. So in the first group, basically all the participants were given a tight um, face mask, um, basically no air leakage. In the second group, there was a small hole poked in to kind of um, try and replicate a slight air leak. And in the third group, the uh, face mask was or basically the face mask was applied. The participants were instructed to give three deep full volume breaths and then basically they were induced and group four was not pre oxygenated at all, but mask ventilation, uh, but were mask ventilated three times after inducing anesthesia. And so from that study overall, we see that, you know, for these participants, typically, you know, at that one and then three minute mark, we're still around 96% saturation overall kind of throughout this. Um, there was another study conducted in, I believe the early nineties, um, by, I believe the pronunciation is Yancey, apologies if that's incorrect, uh, but basically is looking at the effect of obesity on safe duration of apnea in the anesthetized humans and was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia. Uh, a group of 24 patients underwent general anesthesia and their oxygenation was measured. Uh, the overall protocol, so the patients were instructed to breathe 100% room air, or 100% oxygen rather, through a clear face mask attached to a circle system. Um, with an inline mass spectrometer. So basically, they're trying to displace all the nitrogen in the FRC, and basically that was verified with um, end tidal uh, nitrogen concentration. And so basically, um, in these patients, um, it showed that for the Group one, which was basically patients who were deemed to be, um, you know, of a near to ideal body weight status, it took on average around six minutes for them to reach an oxygen saturation of around 90%. Um, for kind of larger patients, um, it was around, I think, like 2.7 minutes or something along those lines. Slight importance to note, these people were all assessed in a supine position, so slight modifications could be made if they were seated. So. What does this mean? Overall, we see that on average, um, it takes you know a fairly healthy adults around six minutes to uh, you know reach an oxygen saturation of around ninety percent, or kind of nearing that desaturation place. And so, 
in respect to that, you know, how long does it take neuromuscular blockade to last? You know, how long does neuromuscular blockade last, last for? And so in this study here, this is a 2009 study published by, or published in anesthesiology by Lee et al. They looked to assess this. So basically, they looked to see how long it took to achieve effective reversal of neuromuscular blockade after receiving either succinylcholine or rocuronium and so, uh, after reversal with Cigamidex. So this trial randomized 115 patients with minimal core morbidities undergoing routine surgery under general anesthesia to either receive 1.2 milligrams per kg of rocuronium in addition to uh, 16 milligrams per kilogram of Cigamidex, which was given at the three minute mark, um, or succinylcholine, um, one milligram per kilogram. Both groups were um, induced with propofol, fentanyl, and midazolam. And so the primary endpoint of the study was time to recovery of the T1 uh, to 10%. And basically, T1 is uh, an assessment of the overall kind of quality of the neuromuscular blockade as assessed by kind of twitch. It's either assessed either which at the adductor pollicis muscle or orbicularis oculi. And so the results in this study showed that the group receiving rocuronium and sigamidex reached um, that 10% of the T1 point at 4.4 minutes versus 7.1 minutes at the, in the succinyl choline group. So additionally, they also measured the time to 90% um, recovery of T1 with the rocuronium and sigamidex reaching that uh, at around 6.2 minutes versus 10.9 minutes in the succinyl choline group. Um, overall, what does this kind of mean? So if we saw in the studies before that on average, we have somewhere in the region of around six minutes after we've induced anesthesia for participants to kind of desaturate. And if it takes, you know, around that six minute mark or so for patients to actually kind of recover, recover enough um, uh, neuromuscular potential, um, you know, this kind of maybe puts some question into the claims of, you know, if we deliver that um, blockade up front, then, you know, we're, or if we don't deliver that blockade up front, we're gonna be fine to just let them wake up on their own. Uh, a little bit of context. So typically a patient is deemed safe to extubate uh, or an art interest likely to be able to effectively self-ventilate when the T4 to T1 ratio of 0 0.9 is achieved. So overall, just kind of what this means. So historically shorter acting neuromuscular blockade agents like succinylcholine may have been favored when there weren't concerns that it can't intubate and can't ventilate scenario may be encountered. However, we see that with the introduction of Sigamidex, the time required to achieve the meaningful return of neuromuscular function is somewhere in the ballpark of four to six minutes. Uh, these times are substantially longer in the succinyl choline group, and if we return to our claim, it is unlikely that if we were to encounter a truly difficult airway, like succinyl choline um, would be able to prevent a critical desaturation event. So essentially with Sigamidex, the choice of neuromuscular blockage agent is kind of questionable as far as how pertinent that, um, that aspect of our claim is in current practice. So going from there, uh, what are the claim that neuromuscular blockade can potentially compromise our ability to mask ventilate by facilitating collapse of the oropharyngeal structures? And that was kind of the second component of the claim that the reason why we wait um, to make sure that we can mask ventilate before we give paralytic. And just a little bit of a refresher here. So this is the overall kind of, um, overall kind of, uh, demonstration of the neuromuscular blockade via a non-depolarizing agent. So basically we have full twitch here. After administration, we have successive decline. And then basically what they were monitoring is right around the point that we get to right here, how long it takes to get to that point, and then how long it takes to get to that point in that ratio in that previous study. And so, um, Overall, as far as you know, assessing what's, uh, what effects delivering um, neuromuscular blockade upfront versus delaying has on our ability to kind of successfully uh, face mask ventilate. So there was a 2011 study by Waters et al., which randomized 90 patients to either receive rocuronium or normal saline prior to face mask ventilation. Uh, in the study, there was one blind an blinded anesthesiologist who was assessing the overall quality of all of these events. And basically, um, that anesthesiologist created the difficulty of the mask ventilation two minutes after administration of either rocuronium or nasal, uh, normal saline. The rating scale was based on the factors above. So basically these ones right here. So oral air need for oral or nasal airway, um, what the positive inspiratory pressures were like, um, things along those lines. So those were kind of the overall grading scale. There was also another grading scale here that was assessed that was kind of um, not uh, preceded the, uh, the scale used in the study. 
So, uh, in this study, the patients who received rocuronium were found to be easier to mask ventilate at the two minute mark than those who had received uh, normal saline. And granted, this is all kind of a subjective assessment by one person, however, it is blinded. Um, if we look to more objective measures of what difference just giving that neuromuscular blockade upfront has, um, there was a couple studies. So the one that I was able to include here uh, is a 2004 study by uh, Sachdeva et al. in which 125 patients undergoing genital anesthesia were recruited and were induced using fentanyl and propofil. Uh, they were placed in a standardized head and neck position to try and optimize airflow. Oral airways were placed if needed, and the mask was held with both hands as tightly as possible to achieve adequate tidal volumes. Anesthesia was maintained with uh, isoflurane at a MAC of 1 with fresh gas flow of 6 liters per minute. At the end, tidal concentration of isoflurane reached around 1 MAC. Uh, the expired tidal volumes with each breath were recorded for 2 minutes. Uh, rocuronium at a um, concentration of 0.6 milligrams per kilogram was then given and ventilation was continued whilst the onset of neuromuscular blockade was monitored using a train of four stimulation of the ulnar nerve. Uh, following the absence of twitches on train of four, the expired tidal volumes with each breath were recorded for another two minutes. The individual patient values for expired, expired tidal volume uh, before administering neuromuscular blockade, one minute after the onset of block and two minutes after the onset of block were then um, averaged for each patient to achieve a, to assess the mean tidal volume. So on average, of the group who received uh, neuromuscular blockade, we saw a 61 uh, milliliter increase in tidal volume after delivery. Um, also importantly, no patients experienced a decrease in tidal volume following neuromuscular blockade administration. Um, as I alluded to, there was also another study that I was able to find, unfortunately wasn't able to include in this, but uh, basically in 20, uh, 2019, um, Min et al. published a similar, group, uh, similar study that was kind of looking at um, how, um, what effect neuromuscular blockade had. So basically a title called randomized trial comparing early and late administration with rocuronium before and after checking mask ventilation in patients with normal airways. So it was a prospective RCT, 114 patients um, were given IV rocuronium before or after. Um, and basically title volumes were checked at 20 or 10, 20, 30, and 40, 50, and 60 second uh, increments. Um, in the group who received rocuronium early on, the participants had an average tidal volume of 552 mils versus the late, which is 392. Um, also important to note, the groups that received uh, the neuromuscular blockade upfront were able to be intubated at an average time of 116 seconds. Um, the ones who received that neuromuscular blockade later on, they had to wait until around 195 seconds to intubate. And basically the overall uh, stop go on the intubation was assessed by um, uh, train of four monitoring. And so, of those two studies, so in the previous studies, we've seen kind of data that refutes, you know, aspects of our claims, suggesting that neuromuscular blockade prior to face mask ventilation actually improves, you know, face mask ventilation. Um, but, you know, overall, what evidence kind of exists suggesting what adverse outcomes might occur if neuromuscular blockade was given upfront? So it wasn't the primary aim of this, but in 2011, Matthew and all conducted a two-year prospective study. Uh, the primary aim was to validate a predictive airway algorithm they had developed, that one being right up there. And basically the exclusion criteria for the group, um, so anyone who was already prone to aspiration risk, uh, mouth openings less than 2.5 centimeters, they had any sort of degree of fixed cervical flexion or previous history of an impossible tracheal innovation. So in any of those patients who met those exclusion criteria, they were all innovated um, upfront under awake fiber optic innovation. So of all of those um, participants, um, it included 12,225 upfront. There was only four who met those criteria as I had described earlier. The mean age is around 51. Female to gender ratio was around 64 to 44, uh, male to female. Uh, the algorithm was kind of constructed in such a way that the, any patient deemed to have three or more predictive, uh, three or more predictors for a difficult innovation received succinyl choline immediately at the time of induction and were innovated afterwards without assessing for the ability to face mask ventilate. So in all 12,221 of those patients, there were approximately 125 who had three or more of these criteria here that predisposed them to a higher risk of difficult airway. Um, so all others were induced normally and then basically mask ventilated. Those who were assessed to have a difficult ventilation 
uh, were then immediately given succinylcholine and innovated directly afterwards. So the overall results of this is basically 98% of the patients were able to be successfully innovation, innovated with a MAC blade. Uh, 236 had to be have slight alterations with gum elastic bougie and remainder either underwent video laryngoscope or LMA. Uh, important to note, no one died. There are no aspiration events during the study. Um, and as far as other kind of criteria that you could consider to be adverse events. So there were 87 patients total, so 0.7% of the total population that had a saturation events that went below 90%. Uh, 17 patients, so 0.1% of the study population had a saturation, saturation reading below 80%, and then the lowest saturation reading was 68%. And so overall, the reason that why I kind of included this in the study is even though the primary aim was really not conducted with the intent of assessing, um, you know, what our overall claim focuses on. You know, we saw approximately 12,000 patients who were able to be managed with minimal adverse events and no catastrophic events when neuromuscular blockade was given upfront. And I think more importantly, of the patients who were deemed to be the most likely to have a difficult airway, you know, those 125, no adverse events were encountered in those patients who were just given paralytics prior to. And. I think at the end of this, you know, there was a couple, couple different polls that were I encountered that was kind of assessing, you know, what proportion of uh, anesthesiologists really, you know, utilize this, and it's it's honestly it's a pretty split difference. I think there was a, a study in 2009 from the British Journal um, that said something along the lines of like 57% of anesthesiologists didn't, 43% did. Another study saying somewhere along the lines of a 30-30-30 split. Um, and so really some of the other additional considerations that I put in here is even though it may be seeming to be kind of a individual um, provider kind of discretion whether or not this is done, um, there was a couple studies that I found. So the first portion of the text on the left, so it's an article from Bouvet and all in 2014, demonstrated rates of gastric insufflation with face mask ventilation at various pressures. So typically we're usually given a rating of around 20 centimeters of water as being kind of the pressure that needs to be reached in order to compromise that lower esophageal sphincter and risk inducing any sort of insufflation. And basically they monitored both with um, esophagram and with um, ultrasonography of the gastric contents at um, PFP values of 5, 10, 20, 25, and 30. And they, say that, they saw that even in groups going down to around 20 or 15%, there were still some patients who did see some insufflation events going on. Um, the portion of the text on the right-hand side is from an article in 2018, basically showing that, um, again, there is you know, technically a, a risk of insufflation of the, the stomach, you know, possibly leading to an aspiration risk further down the road. You know, in this group on the right, um, the max, um, the, the peak airway pressure is only reached 19 centimeters of water. And so basically overall these studies highlight some of the other, other considerations as far as risks that may come um, with face mask, face mask ventilation, especially when being done either in kind of an emergent setting or being conducted by kind of um, less experienced personnel. And so overall kind of summary, so I think as far as kind of the smaller claim is that, you know, really the quality of face mask ventilation can help guide our paralytic choice. I think, you know, with the advent of Sigamidex, you know, rapid and reliable reversal of blockade is achievable to such the extent that even a patient who's difficult to face mask ventilate, you know, theoretically they could be reversed, um, you know, in a reliable and rapid manner. And, and as far as kind of the sequence of events, you know, kind of that concern that if we deliver neuromuscular blockade up front, we're gonna have collapse of those airway structures, which is going to kind of decrease our ability to effectively ventilate. I think the study by Warders et al. showed that, you know, overall, um, you know, that it's not really the case. And granted that was, you know, a subjective evaluation. The subsequent studies, you know, did show that there is an objective measurement that can be shown with delivering that paralytic upfront without any sort of real risk in those patients. Um, I think one of the other aspects of the, the WORS study is, you know, perhaps equally as important, while the study relied on one anesthesiologist as the arbiter of the difficulty of the face mask ventilation, the majority of the patients who received normal saline were evaluated as having no change pre or post administration of it. So really kind of maybe shows that there's a little bit more of a signal to noise ratio there. 
Um, and then lastly, kind of as I was speaking to earlier, even though the primary study of, or the primary aim of the Amatsu study wasn't really, you know, aiming to show whether or not face mask ventilation needs to be confirmed prior to neuromuscular blockade, in that patient group who's most likely to have a difficult airway, no adverse events are really encountered. And so kind of circling back, um, you know, the claim revisited and where does this kind of leave us? Um, you know, I think, I think you could make the arguments that in certain patients and in certain populations, you know, we can, we can get by really without needing to ensure face mask ventilation. So one of the, the caveats to this though is, so to date, none of the studies that really I encountered specifically sought to randomize patients to either undergo face mask ventilation or not and assess the outcomes. Um, the closest I was able to find was that Amatsu study. Um, you know, I, I definitely would argue that further studies need to be uh, done in order to really assess how, how prevalent or how generalizable these claims were. A lot of the exclusion criteria in these studies really did not, uh, did not allow for any patients with, um, you know, kind of ASA greater than four to be included. Um, so as overall, I think you can kind of make the claim that in the right setting in the right patient, really there's not much of a need to face mask ventilate. But as far as the overall claim itself, I think that may be a little bit harder to, uh, to definitively answer um, from what, what evidence we currently have. Okay. Anybody have any um, questions or comments? We do have an anesthesiologist in the audience. What do you think? When, when I was practicing, usually we use the modify one. We would do the ventilation after giving the neuromuscular block, mostly because we were afraid that we were doing the ventilation with the not the neuromuscular block. We know that in, neuromuscular block decreased the pa uh, increase the patency of the airway, so it's just so much easier. And the, the, we were afraid that we had just to stand the stomach. Yeah, we don't want to that, so we'll try to minimize that. So we usually we do the what we call it the modified ventilation technique, like to try to ventilate after and then we'll wait and everything was going okay. Then it just give you a peace of mind that we have time in case things doesn't get as predicted. And then my practice, we didn't have like video letting off copies. We were using a Macintosh and a bougie, and we have to deal with that, right? Um, the other thing, and then with the, because also with the advent of the Sugamadex, it's just a reverse so quickly. There's like the same time that you, the patient will wake from the, the, the set of the hypnotics and the other medications give. So there was not even, at least when I was practicing, I never had this routine to ventilate prior to give the anonymous club block. I would do, but I would do after. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, said it was really practice or provider dependent on the depending upon the rotations that I was on I think there was maybe a little bit higher of a likelihood for kind of residents to make sure that that you know you could face mass ventilate before giving that blockade as opposed to some of the attendings where they're just like no nah, just give it and let's get this rolling um, I think one of the other aspects that I, I didn't really expand that much on is that you know a lot of these studies were conducted in very controlled environments by senior anesthesiologists um, you know, how applicable this is as far as, you know, to Dr. Freed's points that we were discuss discussing before, you know, how applicable this is this uh, in an ICU setting where things are a lot less predictable, where you have a lot sicker patients um, is a lot less clear. Um, additionally, like I said, the exclusion criteria really didn't include any like morbidly obese patients, no pregnant patients, no really sick patients. And so anybody who doesn't have that FRC that's going to allow them to have that around six minute, you know, reserve of oxygenation, you know, the question of whether or not maybe you want to be a little bit more careful is kind of questionable. Um, so yeah, I think if you, depending upon how you kind of split this myth, you know, as far as whether or not everybody needs to have this, you know, checked or confirmed, I think maybe that you could say is, is debunked, but as far as, you know, do some patients still need to have this confirmed? I think that one's maybe a little bit harder to definitively kind of slap away just because we don't have a ton of evidence that directly uh, addresses those, those questions. I think it's important to remember that that patient population is completely different than what we have in the ICU. Rarely do we ever have patients who are fasted. Rarely do we ever have the option of changing our mind and saying, oh, I'm not going to intubate this patient. 
for almost always the tube has to go in one way or the other and so no way does um, the ability to bag a, a patient change the course there's just high risk in the ICU it's not found in the uh, OR setting I'm never going to say oh come back tomorrow we'll do it tomorrow yeah yeah I'm going to go forward every time Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's a different population than the general anesthesia populations in the operating room and from the ICU. And I, just before we vote, one comment I wanted to make is that a lot of times when we are having difficulty bagging somebody in the ICU setting anyway, um, well, two comments. One is that frequently if you use an oral airway, it relieves the whole problem. And I think it's, they're very underutilized um, in that setting, uh, which is why basically the respiratory therapists know that if I'm intubating the patient, they better have an oral airway ready. Um, I don't always use it, but it's always there and available. And then um, the other is that a lot of times once you give the paralytics, they're easier to bag as well, which I think was shown in some of these studies that you presented. So, all right, um, I think it's time to vote. So the topic sentence is for patients undergoing general anesthesia. So this doesn't include ICU patients. It doesn't really. Um, the ability to ventilate via face mask should be checked or confirmed before administering a paralytic and prior to intubation. So how many people think this is true? We should be doing this anyway. Continue to do this, I guess. Uh, okay. How many think it's plausible? Okay. How many think this is busted? Okay, just a few. So I guess once again, we're... Um... <laughs>